Ka tangi te titi, ka tangi te kaka, ka tangi hoki a hau te he Māori ona. E nā mana, e nā reo, a rā raka te rama, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko wai au, um, nō o te poti a hau, ko kotarani te iwi, uh, hei kai mahi a hau te wharawānanga o tāko, uh, ko Richard Blakey tāko uh, Good evening everyone, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Richard Blakey, um, I'm here on behalf of the Vice-Chancellor uh, and Acting Vice-Chancellor, both of whom give their uh, apologies. I know uh, both David and, and Helen Nicholson, and Helen in particular who was scheduled to be there, uh, would dearly have loved to have been here to present. Um, I think uh, just with Helen's current injuries, I think she's just uh, uh, needed to go home. So um, I'm um, very honoured to be able to step in in my role as Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research and Enterprise and act as host for tonight's inaugural prof professorial lecture. I'll um, give a brief mihi vakatau and then some welcomes and then I'll um, outline the order of proceedings. Um, tēnē tu raro e uh, te maru o kamana whenua, uh, ka te mamo e waitaha kaita, kaitahu no mai haramai taiti mai. I stand here under the umbrella of the people of this place, ka te mamo e waitaha and uh, kaitahu and welcome you here. Um, ki te whare uh, tu nei, uh, tēnā koe, tu tonu, tu tonu, to the house that stands here, may you stand forever. And a mate haere haere hoki atu rā ki te po. And to those that have passed, uh, we remember you and wish you well in your in your return to dark. Um, um, uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Greetings to everyone. Um, and, uh, ko uh, ahurangi uh, professors uh, Lisa Masu Smith, Peter Dearden, uh, Patricia Priest, um, uh, tēnā uh, to our other members of the academic party, and in particular uh, to uh, <coughs> uh, Professor Steph Hughes, uh, Tenakwe, and we're really looking forward to your inaugural professorial lecture. To your whānau um, who are here and online, special greetings for your father Peter, your sister Delwyn and niece Nicole, who I believe are here, to your um, brother-in-law Brendan and nephew Reese online and I understand some special families whose research and, and scholarship uh, you've uh, particularly engaged with are online. So, uh, no mai hara mai welcome uh, and uh, ki te um, ahuraki e kaimahi a te whare wānanga o tāko, uh, te um, manuhiri o te otopoti uh, te wai paunamu, uh, Aotearoa, e te hoe fa, no mai hara mai welcome. So to those who, other members of staff of the University of Otago, professors and, and other people that work at Otago, to um, visitors from the city of Dunedin, South Island, New Zealand, and the four winds wherever you may come from in person or online, welcome to you all. This is a great celebration of an achievement of the highest academic rank within our, within our university promotion to the uh, position of professor. So we like to celebrate with our regalia, with an opportunity to, to gather and hear about the things that have led to that promotion, the, the outstanding um, activities, the scholarship, the teaching, the service, uh, and in particular, the leadership that has been demonstrated. Um, Professor Matasu Smith will give a more detailed introduction uh, to Steph before she gives her, her presentation. Peter and Trish will sum up before uh, refreshments. But I just want to say, in looking at your academic record and your CV, um, I can understand how, um, how it may have been a relatively straightforward decision for the promotion committee to, to reach that. Um, when you, your applications went through. You, you have performed exemplary uh, service in teaching and research, and in particular, you're working in an area where you um, are focused on delivery of benefits and real benefits to a, a community that <clears throat> needs at times quite focused and fundamental research, and also it, it leads to um, discoveries and developments that will go into your teaching program. You have leadership both through the Brain Health Research Centre at the university and also in the, in the genetics teaching program that demonstrate your commitment to service as well. So with that, um, I will ask Professor Lisa, Lisa Matasu smith to come and introduce you, but I will also ask the audience uh, to share in my sincere congratulations on behalf of the university for this well-deserved promotions. Well done.
E nā koutou katoa, ko Lisa Madison smith toko ingoa, uh, ko te, uh, te tumuaki o te kura uh, matairangoa koe ora. Uh, so my name is Lisa Madison smith I am the acting uh, dean of the School of Biomedical Sciences, and it is my honour and my joy um, to be able to uh, introduce our inaugural prof professorial lectures uh, that are of staff in the School of Biomedical Sciences. So this is, um, this is one of those joyous occasions of, of true celebration where we get to, I get to sit down and look at, you know, at the, the academic achievements um, of, of our staff, which really makes me incredibly proud to be um, part of this school and, and in the, the role of acting dean. But kind of more, um, more exciting, I think, is actually hearing the real story of, of how these outstanding academics have gotten to the place where they are. And you actually really get a feel for the person, for their path that they've taken. Um, and I think, you know, I really wish we had more of our uh, postgraduate students and, and younger scholars to hear these incredible stories um, about how kind of unpredictable often our careers are and um, and how you know taking opportunities and seeing seeing kind of these interesting questions arise and following those pathways is actually how so many of our staff um, get to this this point and this point that we're we're celebrating their success so um, this is truly I think one of those um, one of those evenings and uh, it has been a joy to um, have watched uh, watched this happen over over the last um, ten years or so when I first um, kind of got to know about Steph's research. So just a bit a bit of the kind of formal background um, that that we celebrate in in these events. Um, Steph got her BSc from Victoria University Wellington um, in 1994, degree in biochemistry. Went on and did her first class honors um, uh, and graduated. Uh, 1995, the next year, in genetics and molecular biology. So you're already starting to see kind of some breadth in, um, in the training and approaches uh, that I think have gotten her to where she is today. Um, she did a BH, PhD in biochemistry um, at Victoria and uh, then went off to do a postdoc um, in, in July 1999. Um, in the Davidson Lab in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of Iowa. Um, she was there uh, through till 2002, where she briefly did some lecturing uh, at Victoria University and thankfully, um, uh, and, and followed that with, sorry, a, a research fellow position um, at uh, the Department of Pharmacology and Clinical Pharmacology at the University of Auckland. So she was there from 2003 to 2008. And thankfully, in March of 2008, um, she was lured to the University of Otago uh, and took up a role, her role as lecturer uh, in the Department of Biochemistry uh, here in, in Dunedin. Uh, was made a senior lecturer in 2012, uh, associate professor in 2019, and in February 2022, uh, was promoted to professor in, bio in the Department of Biochemistry. Um, Steph has been the Deputy Director of the Genetics Teaching Program from 2017 uh, to 2020, uh, and in 2019 was the Deputy Director of the Brain Health Research Center and became, uh, in, in February of 2020, the Director of the Brain Health Research Center. Um, so, as we've already heard, showing outstanding leadership uh, in research and teaching. So as we all know, or most of us know, Steph is a molecular neurobiologist um, who has focused her career, uh, and we'll be hearing tonight, on understanding Batten disease, um, which is a group of cruel childhood brain diseases. Uh, and it was, um, you know, I first heard Steph uh, about, about 10 years ago now, I think, uh, talk about her research on Batten disease and, and have been following um, the, that research and the impact of that research um, since that time. Steph was really um, one of the early gene therapists in this country, uh, and she established the multi-user gene vector facility here at Otago that was uh, later funded by the Brain um, Research New Zealand. And that, um, 
that facility has not only allowed her to do the, the incredible work that she's been doing, but has also uh, supported uh, many, many other researchers um, in this field, in the broader field. Um, she says her greatest achievement has been seeing gene therapy uh, for one form of Batten disease move into clinical trials. And this thera therapy was originally developed uh, in Steph's lab. Um, so that is an incredible um, uh, achievement to take it you know, from the bench um, and, and actually moving, moving into clinical trials. And you know, not a lot of, of people are able to take, to take that step. Um, in recent years, her group has uh, extended the research into multiple genetic forms of Batten disease using human neurons and astrocytes to understand disease processes uh, and test new therapeutics. She's on several international Batten disease scientific advisory boards. She is clearly the expert in this field. She has received over $70 million, uh, in funding from national, major national and international agencies, including the Royal Society of New Zealand Marsden um, Fund, Health Research Council of New Zealand, Neurological Foundation of New Zealand, Cure Kids, uh, Lottery Health, the Charlotte and Gwyneth Gray Foundation, and Batten Disease Support and Research uh, Association, both um, in the U.S. She is incredibly um, well integrated across uh, departments and within the Division of Health Sciences here at the university, uh, working with colleagues across the division, but also uh, internationally. She's publishing uh, her research in the top neuroscience uh, journals, um, also is an incredible uh, teacher and mentor, um, certainly one of the, the things that um, that I get to see uh, on on Facebook <laughs> is is the great um, celebrations that uh, Steph's lab uh, regularly posts about, and you see the enthusiasm in the students and the postdocs and the people working in our group. It is truly um, a, a wonderful uh, group to to watch and watch celebrate, um, which I think we need to do more of. Um, so she's, as I say, passionate about her teaching. Um, she has taken 18 PhD students through um, to graduation, nine master's students, and at least 15 honors and, and summer students. So really passing on that commitment and joy um, that she has in teaching. Um, she also has a, a commitment and um, skill for outreach and engagement. Um, and. Um, is involved in, in lots of, of public lectures, and it was, in fact, um, in the a public lecture series that I first met Steph when we did a um, women in genetics uh, kind of road trip um, from through Genetics Otago, uh, and I think there were three or four or five of us uh, who, who traveled around um, and got to talk to school kids and communities about our research, and as I say, that's when um, I first heard Steph talk about Batten's disease. Batten disease, and I, um, I didn't know anything about it at the time. And uh, to see that, that you know, scientific rigor and the commitment that she's made, um, not only to the research, but to the families um, of children with Batten disease is, is you know, that, that's what being a true um, scientific researcher and academic um, is about. And, and so it is, um, Truly a joy to be here celebrating your inaugural professorial lecture. Um, we've also, um, I get to see a lot more of, of uh, Steph's accomplishments and in, in, uh, other activities every morning. Um, we are both uh, fans of Wordle. Um, <laughs> and uh, I have to make sure now that I don't look at my Twitter feed because Steph gets up a little bit earlier than I do, and, and she does her Wordle first, and she's always posting little clues in her statement, so I, I, I can't look at Twitter until I've already done my Wordle, because I, because otherwise Steph is gonna, gonna influence my, my Wordle choice. We also share a, a love of alpacas, and, and uh, I get to see her, um, her, her life with alpacas and, and her other uh, critters, uh, cats and dogs, and there's always seems to be another puppy, um, which again, brings us great joy. Um, so uh, it's, it's our lives overlap in interesting ways. And so I was very interested to see the uh, trumpet on, on your poster for your IPL, and I notice it's there, because um, as a former trumpet player, or maybe we have another, <laughs> another activity uh, um, 
in common there. But uh, I think really um, the title of, of Steph's uh, IPL tonight really says it all. Is it? It's about the families, uh, the families her re the families with Batten's disease, the families um, in her research group, uh, and and in the department. Um, and that is what um, it's her passion um, for the family and understanding the development of therapies um, for treating these these devastating um, childhood diseases. So um, please join me in welcoming. Professor Stephanie Hughes um, for her inaugural professorial lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Ko Peter Rawa, ko Anne Takumatua. Ko Stephanie Taku Ingoa, he erangi o ho, e te whare wananga o Otago. No rewa, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā tato kato. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, both Richard and Lisa. I'm quite overwhelmed right now, but I'll try and calm down enough to um, begin my my IPL. So my IPL is all about family, and I think Lisa summed it up quite nicely in terms of what family is to me. It's not just my biological family, but also my lab family, um, my friends, my dog family, my animal family, um, and most importantly, perhaps the Batten family that's really sustained me through my whole research career. So what I'm going to do is go through the various types of family um, I believe in. Um, my biological family I'll start with, going through a bit of my history and how we came to Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, my lab families and our studies of Batten disease right from my PhD uh, through to today. The role that the Batten's families have played um, in my career and how important they've been. Uh, my collaborations um, that have developed mainly through the role um, of the gene therapy vector facility that we've developed at Otago. And then I'll talk a little bit about my um, outside family. So my dad's family originated um, on the paternal side from Ireland, uh, just east of, sorry, west of um, Dublin. Uh, John Hughes was a surveyor uh, who married a teacher, Eliza, and they immigrated in 1849 um, and settled in Wellington, where John Hughes surveyed the town belt for about 200 pound, I believe, which seems quite a lot of money. Maybe I've got that number wrong. So he was a surveyor. His son, T.W., was also a surveyor. My grandfather, Vern, was also a surveyor, so you see there's a little bit of family history going on here. On my maternal side, or dad's maternal side, uh, my grandmother, Evelyn, um, came from um, Napier, uh, and she uh, is descended from Scots, uh, right on the border um, of Scotland and Wales. Uh, sorry, Scotland and England, um, and her father was a business owner. They had various shops around the North Island. So Vern and Evelyn uh, got together and they had three children. Dad um, also pictured here, and you'd never guess it, but he was also a land surveyor. <laughs> so there's a little bit of family history going on here, and I broke the mould. Dad said to me um, yesterday, in fact, that you were supposed to be a land surveyor, but I guess you did okay. Okay, so on my mum's side, um, Edwin and Annie Parsonage came from Mould in uh, Wales uh, via Bolton, and they settled um, on the west coast in the uh, coal mines. And on the other side of the family, uh, George and Euphemia came from Scotland as well, um, and their daughter Georgina married my great-grandfather, uh, and my grandmother, Mavis Parsonage, uh, married Harry in Wellington. And they had two children, my mum, Anne, and my uncle, Alan. 
So Harry, you'll see something hanging on his coat. He won the ISO, which was an award for um, public servants. He was the Secretary of Labor um, for quite a long time um, in the last century. And he also played the trumpet and the euphonium. So this is where that little link comes from. So he was in charge of the brass bands that went to uh, Europe in the 1950s. And when he retired, he bought a trumpet to continue playing. And I'll come back to that um, a little later. So mum and dad met in Wellington. Dad was from the Waikato, still is really from Waikato. Um, he and mum met in Wellington and married. And then one year later, up uh, pops me. And then three years after that, my sister Delwyn was born. So we uh, were brought up in Broadmeadows, which is in the northern suburbs of Wellington, but we spent a lot of our um, holidays on the Kapiti Coast around Raumati to start with, and eventually we had a property um, in Waikanae uh, on the Kapiti Coast. So we had a lot of fun there, we had a great childhood. Um, we had a caravan to start with and eventually um, a small um, batch that we used to go to. Okay. So when I was a kid, obviously I was supposed to be a surveyor and we used to go with Dad um, on the job and this is me here and Delwyn um, on a job up in the Wairarapa with Dad. Um, I used to quite like being a chainman so I used to wander around holding the staff for him. Um, but as you can work out from now, I didn't actually quite make it to surveying. I also had a huge interest in books and I used to put all the books on my bookshelf um, in Dewey Decimal order and alphabetical order. Um, it's a little bit crazy. So I did actually spend quite a lot of time in libraries um, over my early childhood. This is my grandfather again um, and as I said he was a musician so I used to go to his place um, in the weekends and try and play the trumpet. By the time I got to intermediate, so I went to Rara Intermediate, I had the most fantastic teacher, uh, Dougal Scott, who some of you might know. He was at the teacher's um, college eventually as the dean there. Um, and he really inspired my love of science and moved me away slightly from surveying as a career. Okay, so from Raro Intermediate, I went to Wellington Girls College where my mum had been an old girl. And by seventh form, I was completely addicted to science and maths. I did all three sciences and two maths and dumped the English and all those other subjects. So I was pretty much on a, on a track for science. I then, as Lisa has said, went to Victoria University, but what she didn't say, oops, forgot that bit, um, I'll come back to it in a minute, was that I was going to major in maths and stats, okay? The problem with maths and stats is you have to learn all these formula um, and all the derivations of all the formula. By the time I got to that, I couldn't remember how I was supposed to use them. So my marks weren't quite as good in that as they were in um, population biology and um, genetics. So this is um, Dave Burton, who was um, one of the most fantastic teachers in first year um, genetics, and Peter's nodding his head too, you remember him. Um, and he really inspired me to change over from maths and stats to biochemistry and genetics. I'll go back to this, so um, as I've mentioned already, um, I was into music, so all of my lunch times were either spent in orchestra practice or in the library. Okay, so unlike today where all of your lectures are giving, your lecturers will give you PowerPoint slides and all the notes, I used to scrawl everything down at 100 miles an hour and then go home and write them all out again. So as you can see, I actually hear quite nice writing at that stage today. I'm sure my students would say that it's not quite that good. Okay, so I did my BSc and then I decided to stay at Vic. Didn't really want to leave home at that stage. It was too cheap and the meals were too good. So I started my honours degree uh, with Jeff Rickards, another fantastic inspirational scientist who worked on chromosomes, mainly in plant chromosomes, and I wasn't quite that keen on plants, wanted to keep working in genetics um, of human cells. So he really let me design my own honours project, which is pretty much unheard of. Um, 
So what I decided to do was take some human chromosomes, um, some blood cells, treat them with a drug that causes um, cancer and have a look at what happened to those cells. And what happens is they form these breaks in the chromosomes and those um, are signs of what we call fragile sites, which are um, regions of instability in, in human chromosomes. So that was probably my first experience of being actually able to design experiments by myself, come up with hypotheses. So that all ended well, and I graduated um, with first class honours. From there, this is where Batten disease really set in. I was looking around for, an honor, for a PhD project and I stumbled into Bill Jordan's um, office and he was really interested in animal um, biology and animal disease. He worked on facial eczema. I was like, well, I really like to work with you, Bill, but I don't really want to work on facial eczema. I want to work on human disease. And he said, well, I've just had a PhD student finish who worked on something called Batten disease. He told me all about what Batten disease biology was all about and what I could do, but he didn't actually tell me anything at all about what Batten disease itself was, what the clinical symptoms were or, um, or what the disease was actually about. So I remember going home, I remember walking up to mum and saying, guess what, I'm going to do a PhD on Batten disease. She was like, what's Batten disease? And I said, oh, it's got something to do with Jean Batten, I think. She must have had it. <laughs> Turns out it was nothing to do with, with Jean Batten. So then, of course, I went, couldn't Google in those days, so I went to the library and had a look at what I could find. Turns out that Batten disease is not named after Jean Batten at all. It was named after a clinician, Frederick Batten, who identified two children in uh, 1903 um, that had a infantile dementia. So they started um, losing all their capacity. It was actually discovered about 30 years earlier than that by a Norwegian clinician, but he wrote in Norwegian and no one could find, um, could interpret what he'd said. So the disease has been named Batten disease ever since. So the New Zealand connection started in the 1980s by a vet pathologist, Bob Jolly. Bob Jolly's from Massey and he identified um, in the 1980s one sheep form of Batten disease, so a naturally occurring model in sheep, where these sheep were doing some strange sort of um, behaviours, they would pace around, they wouldn't flock, they wouldn't respond to dogs, and something was not quite right. So he identified that there was this fluorescent material within neurons within the brain um, that resembled what you would see in Batten disease. His PhD student Dave Palmer, who was also a mentor of mine, then identified what the protein was that was accumulating in the disease. Um, and from there, Bill Jordan, who was a proteomics guru and studied proteins, decided to try and work out why this particular protein called subunit C was accumulating in the disease. So I came in in the early, mid-1990s and started studying Batten disease. I took initially liver cells from the sheep and ran probably 200 of these, what are represented here are gels, so you separate proteins um, in two dimensions to try and work out and then compare and contrast between liver from affected animals and control animals. So that sent me on a little bit of a wild goose chase. It turns out that this protein, although it accumulates, doesn't really do anything in the disease. Um, so that's kind of, it's a marker for disease, but it doesn't actually tell you a whole lot about what's going on. So I finished my first year, year and a half or so, running all these gels, not really getting too far, and Bill said to me, so what do you want to do next? He was very like Jeff Rickards, and he was very open to letting me decide what I wanted to do. And I said, well, this is a brain disease. I'm working on liver. I want to be working on the brain. Can't work on whole brains. Let's go and make neuronal cultures. So let's take these brains, put them into a dish, and see if we can look at the disease in that way. And he said, well, don't know much about that, but off you go. You can go to a course in England, which is what I did. I spent six weeks in England learning how to grow these cells. 
And that's really become um, the backbone of everything we've done since. So this is probably one of the key results from my PhD study. We don't need to worry too much about this cartoon, uh, but obviously the guy that did that knew what track I was on. So what I did is culture neurons from sheep affected with Batten disease and normal neurons, and then I looked for the accumulation of that protein, so I mean at C, which I says, said actually doesn't have a lot to do with the disease. But it is still a good marker that we have disease processes. In 1999, I graduated with my PhD, and from there, I moved to Iowa, as Lisa said. So just like Bill, I haven't actually told you what Batten disease is, I just told you what I did with it. So I'm gonna step back and tell you a little bit about what Batten disease is all about. It's actually a family of 13 different genetic diseases, so patients will have one of 13 different, or mutations in one of 13 different genes, which lead to a very similar disease. The difference is in the presentation, the age of onset, and what symptoms come in what order. So these are all examples of children that have one or other form of Batten disease. They all, in all cases, will develop um, normal milestones, they'll be born apparently healthy, and at some point between the ages of six months and generally about eight, they will start um, presenting with different symptoms. So those symptoms include blindness, motor problems, learning difficulties, hallucinations, seizures, and eventually, this is all progressive, they get to the point where they can't walk, talk, swallow, or feed. And up till now, it's always been fatal. So for the lay audience, this is a combination of epilepsy, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and blindness in children. And at this point, I normally cry. So in terms of the biology of the disease, it's also something called a lysosomal storage disease, which means that this protein that's accumulating, subunit C, accumulates in something called the lysosome. These lysosomes are like the recycling centers of your cell. And so what normally happens is parts of your cell that have been used up go to the lysosome and they get broken up by molecules called enzymes so that they can be reused in other parts of the cell. In Batten disease and other lysosomal storage diseases, instead of being broken up, they just keep accumulating, okay? If you get too much material in that lysosome, eventually the cell can't handle it, especially neurons in the brain, and you get the symptoms that we've just talked about. So what happens when we get loss of function of one of these genes, the 13 different genes I mentioned, is that neurons go from looking nice and healthy, as shown in green in this top image, to being really stunted and beginning to die in the bottom image. We don't completely understand the link between these genes, the lysosomal storage, and how these cells die. It's something we're still working on. Okay, so now look away if you don't want to know what the rest of the story is. I'm going to give you a summary. Okay, so a bit of a spoiler alert. I started off by telling you about the cell culture models we developed in um, Wellington. I then moved to the US where I learned everything I needed to know about gene therapy. From there, I came back to New Zealand, took the sheep that we'd been working on during my PhD and developed some gene therapy strategies for those sheep. And this has now gone to clinical translation. So between there and here, we've actually now gone back to some of the cell culture work using, instead of sheep cells, using human cells to model the disease and test a whole range of different therapies. Okay, so you can wake up again if you've turned off for the spoiler. So my postdoc um, in gene therapy was with Prof. Bev Davidson at the University of Iowa, and this was a big center of gene therapy at the time in the US. And she was a relatively new investigator who had some really amazing ideas and some big money, which is always useful. 
So gene therapy is basically where you take a gene, a piece of genetic material that's potentially therapeutic, and you put it into a virus. But you take a virus and you disable all the bad parts. So you take out all of its DNA and you put in your therapeutic gene instead. And now we've got a happy virus that can do good instead of causing disease. So this is basically a vehicle that allows you to transport that therapeutic into tissues really effectively. And it's very hard to take a piece of genetic material without having the vehicle there and get it into something like the brain. So one of the um, studies that we did while I was in the US was actually to use this gene therapy approach to treat a different lysosomal disease called Sly syndrome. We had a really nice mouse model for this disease. And what we could actually do is take animals that already showed symptoms, add this gene therapy, and actually reverse the disease progression and reverse the behavioral deficits. And that was pretty incredible and something that doesn't happen in all diseases because once you've lost neurons, it's very hard to replace. Okay. While I was there, I had a surrogate family. I was away from home for the first time. Um, I shared a flat with the Martin family and I had many other great friends and colleagues who supported me during that time. Okay, so I'm actually gonna skip ahead past Auckland back to Otago, um, mainly because when I was in Auckland, I wasn't working on Batten disease. And that's obviously the theme of my story tonight. So in 2008, um, I was very lucky to get a lectureship in the biochemistry department and given a room um, and told I could go and buy an incubator and a hood to start making viruses. I was actually told at the time by a future HOD that I'd better do it somewhere away from him because I was using viruses and that was a bad thing. It wasn't Peter. <laughs> okay. So we made viruses based on the skills I developed um, in the US. It was done by a team over time. Kate Linterman was my first um, honours student who continued as an ARF um, for about four years after that point and developed the viruses with me. Holly then um, stayed for about 10 years uh, making viruses and in between we've also had Alison and Kirsten working on these viral vectors. We in about 2010 decided that it wasn't just a lab thing, we were going to expand um, and support other research groups around um, Otago but also around the country and so we set up the Otago Viral Vector Facility um, and have supported as shown here um, over $14 million worth of research. Um, a lot of that funded through HRC, Marsden's, um, and the Brain Research New Zealand um, core. So a huge number of collaborations resulted from this. Okay. So you probably worked out by now, my real passion is Batten disease. And so while I set up this core um, facility, um, for everyone, what I wanted to do was cure Batten. So we had the sheep model, which I've already talked about. Uh, it's caused by mutations in a gene called CLN5. And it, like I said, the sheep have um, developed symptoms, including not being able to flock and not being able to respond to sheep dogs and so on. And they also go blind. So the first thing we needed to do in terms of gene therapy was actually check whether sheep could be transduced or infected with these viruses. No one had done it uh, before. So we took three different types of viruses that we were making in the lab and we injected them directly into the brain using a bit of sheep neurosurgery. And shown in this image here in brown is all the regions that this virus had got where we can get this um, therapeutic protein just by injection into this ventricular space in the brain. So pretty impressive, at least for this particular virus we were using um, and spreading right through the brain. And very important in terms of Batten disease where we have global degeneration. We also got down to the spinal cord through this method um, and right around uh, various 
regions that are important in the disease. So this work um, has been done with uh, colleagues at Lincoln, Dave Palmer again, who was involved in the subunit C story, um, and Nadia Mitchell, who now runs the lab up there, as well as Kate and Holly, who made all the initial viruses that became such a big part of our story. Okay. So like I said, we first tested whether the viruses would work. We then made these viruses to express CLN5, which was the protein that was missing in this form of Batten disease. So we had three different types of viruses, I won't go into detail. We injected them into the ventricle of sheep, and unlike mouse studies, you only need to do three sheep to get a study. Um, they're very expensive to run, and you need a lot of virus um, to get in there. So what we found, um, I've already basically spoiled this for you, was that we could preserve the brain structure. So this is an untreated, affected sheep. This is its brain that I'm just highlighting here, compared to an MRI of a treated animal at the same age. And you can see the difference in size. So we've preserved the structure of the brain and the volume of the brain. We also restored the expression of this protein that was missing in the disease, shown here in black. And we could preserve their cognitive function, so we can preserve their behavior. So this in red is an untreated animal at 21 months of age. It's got a little GPS tracker on its back, so we can monitor where it goes. We put it into this 15 meter long maze, and we put some sheep at the other end, and of course they should go flocking towards their friends. This particular animal doesn't quite know where it's going, and it just goes round in circles. In comparison, an animal of the same age that's affected with Batten disease, but treated with one of these um, vectors, it goes straight to go see its friends. Okay, and this is just multiple animals showing the same trend. Okay, so quite remarkable improvement in behavior. Now what I should say is these animals, unlike what I was showing in the US, were treated before they showed any symptoms. Okay, so we've been able to manage to prevent symptoms developing, but if symptoms have already developed, could we actually maintain function? So I'll just walk you through this little bit of data. This is a rating score we use for Batten disease, the ovine Batten disease rating score. Something equivalent is used in humans, and basically the higher the number, the more cognitively functional they are. Okay, so there's a wide range of tests we do. And shown in blue is the control animals. They maintain function right out to 30 months of age. The untreated affected animals, you can see, go downhill significantly and by about 18 months of age are no longer able to eat or maintain their own um, health. So those are the two extremes. If we look at an animal that's been treated with one type of virus, uh, the lentivirus here, you can see that it's maintained its function when it was injected before onset of symptoms, um, right out to 30 months of age, so it's declining a little. And most of this decline is because its retinal function is impaired, so its eyesight is impaired, and we didn't treat the eye in these studies. Another type of virus you can see maintaining quite nicely again. And if we inject it instead at seven months of age, so this is in the dark gray here, you can see we're not matching the untreated animals, but they're not as good as the affected. So we haven't bounced the activity back to normal, um, but they're still preserving function that they had at the time that the virus went in. Okay. So this is the work that became a clinical trial, there's a lot more studies that have gone on since then, but these are the ones we were initially involved in, and that's gone um, through to the first patients in 2023, through Neurogene. Okay, so I wanna move on to what we've been doing, going back to cell cultures. Uh, so we wanted to see if we could firstly make different models of Batten disease. We've been talking about CLN5, there's 12 others we can work on. And we wanted to move from sheep into human cells. So the technology's been around for the last 
maybe eight years or so, where we can take cells from humans, turn them into stem cells, to primitive cells, and then generate whatever type of cell from the body we want. So neurons, heart cells, muscle cells, anything else we want. So this work started when I was on um, RSL in 2018. I went to Michael Ward's lab in the NIH in the US, spent seven weeks being a postdoc again, having a ball, getting into the lab and mucking things up, and finally being able to generate human neurons from these, these stem cells. So this is an example of the first human neuron that I was able to develop. So we brought this technology back to Dunedin, and this has been taken on um, initially by Indrano, Lucy and Oliver Toby in the lab developing different models of Batten disease using these cells. So these cells, like I said, are derived from skin. You add four magic factors called Yamanaka factors for those of you um, that know the Nobel Prize um, winning efforts and they develop into these stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells that we can then turn into different cells. So in our lab, we generate cortical neurons, which are the most important in Batten disease. We also generate dopaminergic neurons, which Indranil has been studying for Parkinson's disease. We look at astrocytes, which are the kind of support cells. I know a lot more than support cells in the brain, but that's kind of what they're known for. And we can also make these mini brains, so we can generate these three-dimensional structures that look like early developmental time points. Um, and they are quite useful, again, for looking at some of these developmental disorders. Okay, so we took these iPSC cells, we differentiate them into neurons, and we can model different forms of Batten disease. This technology relies, again, on the viruses that we've been able to generate over the last 15 years. But the good thing about these cells is now instead of taking an animal model straight away, we can take a dish of cells, okay, so there's 96 wells in here, and we can treat with any sort of drug, any gene therapy, any library of drugs that we want to to see which ones might affect Batten disease. To do this we need a readout, so we need to be able to see if we add this drug is it going to cause a change in these cells that suggests that we're returning normal function? So we use um, a variety of different methods to do this. The one I'm showing here, this in red, is enzyme activity within the lysosome. So these are the, the core recycling centers of the brain, or of the cell that I was talking about. We can stain these in red, and we can compare those to control cells. Okay, So you can see quite obviously here, a big difference in the lysosomal enzyme activity between Batten disease neurons and controls. So the aim of this is to look, okay, we throw all these different drugs onto each well of the cell and see, of, of the plate, and see which ones turn Batten disease neurons into more control-like neurons. This is a long way from a therapeutic application, but it gives us that method to be able to screen a lot of different chemicals all at once. Okay, so that's kind of where we're going in bulk. I've also started becoming really interested in personalized medicine, how we can actually treat, especially New Zealand patients with Batten disease. And in December last year, I was really privileged to go and visit Summer, a little girl from Cambridge. Um, I was up at field days and I went around to see her family and met um, Summer and absolutely fell in love with her. She's the most gorgeous little girl. Um, she's such a bright spark and a ray of sunshine, and we decided pretty much straight off that we needed to find a way of treating um, her disease. She has a different form of disease, CLM1 um, form of the disease, but what we're planning to do now is taking some of her skin cells, developing these iPSC-derived neurons, and then screening a whole lot of different treatments to see if any of them will work for her specific disease. In this work, we've got a really great team starting to be assembled with Sarah, Emma, and Indranil um, together working to see what sort of therapies we can apply to her case. Okay, 
So, as I mentioned, family is really important. Batten's families are incredibly important to our research. Without them, we wouldn't know what's important um, in terms of their, um, their life and what they want us to be able to try and treat. So I've had a lot of interactions, especially with New Zealand families, but also with families overseas at conferences. Most of our conferences involve both parents and families, clinicians and scientists, which is really quite incredible. Family associations are also really important, as well as the research associations associated with them. And these are all examples of some of the kids that I've met um, over the last 20 years or so. Um, who all have various forms of Batten disease. Okay. So, collaborations are really important. Um, as I mentioned before, most of them have been based on our use of viral vectors and gene therapy. So I really want to acknowledge, although I'm not going to talk about these um, bits of research work, um, various collaborations. So Cliff and Warren both been instrumental in work on Alzheimer's gene therapy, which is starting to come to some sort of um, exciting place as well. I worked with Ruth Empson for many years on motor function, actually on a protein I worked on in my uh, postdoc. Optogenetics, so Louise and I set up the optogenetics um, methods um, using viral vectors. Indranil, um, and I'm now working on Parkinson's mechanisms and Indranil's spearheading that. We've got a really um, neat collaboration going on in Parkinson's disease again, looking at diet and the potential for diet in Parkinson's disease. And then in terms of gene therapy um, and Batten disease, I've been working with Jill Weimer in the US on various aspects of gene therapy and how to improve the gene therapy strategies that we've got. We're all at Tori and Wollongong on stem cells and gene therapy and Batten's and then Catherine and Peter on various more um, fundamental biology aspects of proteins involved in Batten disease. So as Richard and Lisa both said, um, I really love outreach and service and I'm the director of the Brain Health Research Centre. Um, together with Xiao Wen and Ali, who were both um, outreach managers for the BHRC, we've done a large number of different events over the last few years. Um, a lot of brain day events where we get children in um, at the museum, we go off to schools. Um, we've run the Brain Bee for the last couple of years, where we get year 11 students in to talk about um, and do quizzes on the brain, which eventually they go to um, international competition. And most importantly, most significantly, I guess, in the last couple of years has been the start of a program called Positively Wired. This is a program that Ali instigated, along with a large number of others who are listed here, where we take into schools the idea that the kids can control their emotions. So how can they link what they're thinking with what they're doing and how can, they can modify their emotions? And I'll just play a short video which illustrates that. Yeah, I think the children were really positive about what they learned today. I think it's really important for children to learn about how the inside of their body works and how they have some control over what their brain thinks. They absolutely loved looking at their brain waves. So I think, yeah, I, I would think that everybody ticked the where the headset more and look at that more. Uh, they loved doing the tag, so they loved doing something physical. They spend a lot of time thinking that they're passive in their ability to be able to change uh, fixed mindsets and things that they are anxious about. So this has just been a really fun way of learning about the insides of their head and about simple ways that they can reduce that anxiety or things to do when they are tense. So really good. I would see this being very, very good in those first that first year of high school. What was your favourite thing about today? Um, looking at how my brain works on the waves thing. Uh, probably 
looking at the brain thing on the computer and playing the game? Um, I was probably playing the games and looking at the waves. Yeah, so the, the kids are really intrigued by putting these little EEG headsets on and seeing their brain waves and how they change when they're relaxed or when they're stressed if we show them a scary video. Okay, so Lisa already mentioned how we met um, at Women in Genetics, um, did a nation, well, almost nationwide tour um, back in probably 2015 or so, I think it was. Um, I love giving community talks, and I've given a range of these. The most recent ones, um, the lab and I have set off um, talking about our work in gene therapy and stem cells, but with a movie theme. And there's a lot of movies that have um, brain and gene therapy type themes. Your kids, um, our, one of our major sponsors early on in the um, bat and gene therapy research, did a huge promotion during the Rugby World Cup. And there's a song um, that was associated with that, which I'm not gonna play because it will be in your head all night. And sometimes I even do crazy things. This was at Fashionomics at QMB, where I got up on the catwalk and did some crazy things as a virus woman. Okay. So I'm almost finished. Um, my free time family, what I do when I'm not in the lab at work, teaching or out in the community um, is training my dogs. This is my first dog, Marley, who was born in 2002. Um, he passed away a couple of years ago. So Marley, he really wasn't into um, agility, but we gave it a go. Flynn and Cricket are my two older dogs, and then I have a secret gang, Rumour, Whisper, and Echo, who obviously got all their names for, for the same reason. Um, this little girl, Echo, has only um, been with me for four weeks, and she's quite cool. Sometimes we also have invaders in the house. Um, this is a baby alpaca that had to be hand-raised um, for three months. Um, the dog saw, she at least thought she was a, a dog in the end, I think. Okay, so I can't forget the funding family as a rare disease researcher predominantly. I've been really, really amazingly fortunate to get funding for all this research from both small and big organizations. Neurological Foundation and Cure Kids have been critical to a lot of the starting work that we did with gene therapy, and then the bigger funders um, have come in and bulked that out. My Otago Lab family, I can't thank you all enough. It's great to see so many of you here tonight. So we've had about 50 um, people through the lab over the last 15 years, and hopefully I've remembered everyone here. Not only do we work hard, but we have lots of fun as well. Also wanted to acknowledge the past and present HODs um, for all their support. Um, John Cupfield for hiring me in the first place, um, and Peter for keeping me here. And then finally, I just want to thank my biological family. Mum sadly passed away two years ago. She really was my rock, my mentor, my project manager. She used to ring me up every morning and tell me what I needed to do next. I'm um, not quite sure how I cope without that. Um, and my sister and her family, Delwyn, Brendan, Reese, and Nicole. With that, thank you very much for listening. That's a hard act to follow. Tēnā uh, koutou katoa, ko Peter Dedden, tako ingoa. So my name is Peter Dedden and I um, have the immense privilege uh, to be the head of department in which uh, fantastic uh, Professor Stephanie Hughes works. Um, so I get to say some thank you things. Uh, I want to start by thanking you all for coming tonight. Uh, these occasions are really important to us as an academic community and um, it's really great to see both my academic colleagues who are here looking at me going, why is he wearing a shirt with bugs on it? Um, but also uh, family and friends and, and, and the rest of you. And of course, uh, those of you online, it's a delight that you can join us. So, so thank you so much. These, as I say, these, these occasions really mean a lot to us. That's why we get dressed up in the silly outfits. 
Um, but they're as much about you coming to celebrate uh, Steph's achievement as they are about us celebrating Steph. And I just want to make it clear, if I haven't already, we are immensely proud of Steph and her achievements. Uh, to take uh, lab-based therapies from a sheep in a field at Lincoln to actual clinical trials uh, in, uh, in patients that may have a real beneficial effect for those patients is a remarkable thing to do. And it's even more remarkable to do that from here, right? We are a long way from the center of these research things. And I think it speaks to a tenacity and a clear sightedness uh, of somebody to drive that um, all the way from New Zealand. So I wanted to little, talk a little bit about that uh, as a thank you. Uh, so sorry, I, it's very difficult to get me to shut up. So I'm going to um, take the opportunity to say some things because one of the things that I think people don't understand about life sciences, those of you who are in other sciences, is that life sciences are incredibly hard. Uh, our, our DVC here works in physics. In physics, you need a pencil, some thought, <laughs> perhaps a picture of the universe. But biochemistry and genetics are not like that. Not like that. No, they're, they're <laughs> I look forward to them. It's hard. It's not just the development of new ideas and new ways of thinking. It's also the fact that, on average, genetics and biochemistry as sciences don't work. We go into the lab every day and we perform an experiment which is smart and sensible and brilliant, and we go out at the end of the day going, well, that didn't work. And usually it doesn't work because the moon is in the wrong phase or a physicist walked past your office or something. It's not normal. And these Day-to-day -day agonies is one step forward, 83 steps back, makes our science really difficult. So it is a remarkable achievement when you see somebody who can line all of those continuous failures up to produce massive success. It's a remarkable thing to navigate those difficult currents, to, to push against those unfavorable winds, to produce a path all the way to actual change for a person. And I think that's what we saw tonight in this talk, a, a clear-eyed demonstration of going all the way uh, through a difficult science. Another thing I really want to highlight, which I think is incredibly important, is that life science is, is generally problematic for another reason. The, the problem is that it's very, well, it's relatively easy for us as scientists to spend our time starting to understand how biology works, starting to understand our problems in biology, but doing nothing about them, right? We're often... Biology is an observational science, and it takes special character to say, hey, I'm not, I'm not here to observe a problem in biology, I'm here to intervene, I'm here to make a difference. That intervening is very, very difficult, and it can be very controversial. But I think if we're going to um, deal with the myriad biological problems that we have as a society, then we need people like Steph, who can, with care and with honesty and with, with real ability, develop things like gene therapy technologies, to develop these genetically modified methods which allow us to actually intervene in these problems. That is brave, but it is also um, vitally important. Lastly, I'd, I'd like to say that good science asks lots of questions, right? In fact, I think the best science, really good science, goes out there and actually asks more questions than it ever answers. And I think we've seen that tonight. I think we've seen those questions and we've seen the way that they've been answered. But the real best science, and let's face it, even in this straitened times in this university and in this increasingly gloomy world, the best science is what this university and what universities around the world should be doing. And the best science not only asks and answers questions, it also delivers for people. It is about helping. It is about making change. Steph's work uh, demonstrates her desire to use her knowledge and her skills to help people. And I think that that is an incredibly laudable and important thing, an incredibly laudable and important thing for Steph, and an incredibly good lesson for the rest of us who work in universities, who can use our skills and our abilities to change the world. Steph, your promotion to professor surely represents our recognition of your ability to head in the right directions, to push against the difficulties, and to actually deliver. It is an honor today to stand here and thank you for your work in our department. It is an honor to be your colleague. It is an honor to thank you for your work in science. And it is an honor to thank you for tonight's lecture.